Hey guys, Jerry Berg, the Poor Historian here, bringing you another Poor Historian review, this time covering the, what is it called, the Whetstone Cutlery uh, William Wallace Medieval Sword Silver version. Uh, I got this one, actually I got this as a Father's Day present not too long ago, so happy about that. Um, and actually it was for sale on Amazon Prime for $33, free shipping if you have Prime. Definitely qualifies as a Poor Historian Sword. Take a look at this thing. Um, leather scabbard, kind of obviously chromed guard, um, pleather grip, $33 I think so, but we're going to get into a little bit of the depth of this, where it comes from, uh, and see whether it's a good deal or not. Um, plus I think we're going to do a little bit of dissecting at the end. Uh, last time we did that with the Crusader sword, it turned out pretty well, so let's see what happens with this one. So, first impressions. I pull it out and I go, oh, it's rough side leather scabbard. That's pretty cool. Then I look on the side and you might recognize the black leather in there, the kind of crappy gross leather that you get on a lot of India, Pakistan swords. So I was a little disappointed with the scabbard. It's also ridiculously huge, like looks disgusting. Um, like, like you don't need all this extra width on there. Uh, so that's a kind of a negative, but it is leather, which is always a plus. It does have this kind of pointless little strap on the back here that so you can wear it right on your belt there which is kind of dumb no one would actually wear that a sword like that back in the Renaissance um, so we'll see that was that, that was my bad bit about the scabbard but overall it's brown it's passable it looks okay it protects the sword uh, and it's not made with modern material so taking it off Oh, it looks kind of cool. What? What is this? Why is there leather on the Ricasso? Um, clearly, if you are a fan of the movie Braveheart, you might recognize this. This sword is, of course, called the William Wallace sword because it is based on the sword that Mel Gibson used in the um, Braveheart movie. Now, of course, the sword that he used in that movie was a Claymore, a great sword, and this barely qualifies as a hand-and-a-half sword. Um, the reason great swords had the leather on the Ricasso is because sometimes when you wanted to use more fine movements, you would be able to grab that instead of relying on the excessively heavy weight from grabbing it on the cross guard. This, however, does not need that. This I can I can wield this with one hand if I really wanted to. Uh, so the leather on the Ricasso is kind of redundant and unnecessary. And by the end of this video, we're gonna dissect this and remove it and see what's underneath it, because. Overall, this the style does look passable for a 16th century and possibly similar earlier centuries arming swords. Of course, I'm only familiar with the details of weaponry in the 16th century and then other eras as well, but not the 15th century, so I'm not going to claim to, at least not yet. Uh, so let's break it down here. Let's, let's look into more detail. First of all, you might recognize uh, my reaction from the Crusader sword. This is also a plum style pommel, which is great for the 16th century. Um, this little bulb on the end, I'm really not sure what it is useful for. It, it, it's solid, it's, a, it's connected to the pommel as a whole. No idea. If you're familiar with poor historian swords, we will, you will be familiar with the idea of unscrewing the pommel. Uh, little nuts are usually a common sight on low quality swords. And though I'm not going to claim that this is a high quality sword, I have not been able to find a way to unscrew the pommel yet, but I'm going to go ahead and try right now with a lot of strength. And no luck. So if it is screw on or not, it's on there pretty tight. It does definitely have a very un unnaturally bright shine to it. I wouldn't expect that on a uh, a higher quality sword. You can especially see it when we get to the cross guard. This grip is a little weird too. Definitely pleather of some kind. I'm not really sure what's under the handle. I'm not planning on taking the leather off of the handle mostly because I don't have anything more authentic to replace it with nor would I really want to waste that on this sword. Um, but it does, it has a weird sound. I don't know if you can pick that up. Not sure what's under there. Not gonna look. It also has this unnecessary bulb right here on the grip. See this this bulb is normal, that's okay. Um, that's uh, indicative of a hand and a half sword having a bulb in the middle, meaning you could grip it one-handed and that bulb is there to prevent your hand from sliding around too much, or you can grip it two-handed as well. Now, this secondary bulb here, 
I, I have no idea what it's used for. When you're holding it with one hand, it, it feels odd. It feels off. So hopefully when we take this, well, there's another bulb up here, which is obviously to prevent your hand from sliding up the, uh, the Ricasso. So when we take this off, we'll at least see what makes that bulb. If it's a strand of leather or a plastic part, we'll find out. Um, going to the cross guard, nothing too special about it. Uh, the more advanced cross guards that you see, you know, it's not a basic cross guard in terms of style. Um, it has these little bulbs on the end, which is something that I like seeing for a 16th century sword. They didn't have too many generic cross guards at the time. And they were around, don't get me wrong. Um, but a lot of the ones that you see had a little bit of flair to them. Uh, there are some swords in the century that have this little doodle here, um, but not too many from... The, the average sword did not have this little bulb on the little little outlet, outcropping there on the cross guard. Some did, not all of them. Um, well, I've got it, hold on. You can see that it fits into the scabbard there pretty well. See how it fits into the scabbard? Don't think that's really necessary. Oh well. Um, we'll get to the Ricasso. Of course, it's a pleather. You can kind of see the sewn on part there. We'll cut that off in a bit. But the sword itself, it's pretty nice. It doesn't have a fuller, so it's got a diamond shaped cross section. Um, but it feels decently solid. It also did not come sharp. And if you're familiar with poor historian swords, I always think that's a plus. There's no need to have a sharp sword unless you are trying to sell it to someone who is unfamiliar with sword collecting or sword usage. There's not really a point to have a sharp sword unless you're doing cut tests with a high quality sword. So at least it shows that the manufacturer is aware that this sword should not be used for cut tests, it should be used for display, uh, and is not trying to sell it to someone who's unaware of swordsmanship. Um, given that's a little redundant because this is based off of a horribly historically inaccurate Mel Gibson movie. I'm not here to criticize the movie. Um, here to criticize a sword. But it seems, all, it seems good. Um, solid enough. I would actually, honestly, if, this, if, if removing this part goes well and it doesn't look like crap under there, I would not be opposed to having this as a side weapon for someone who is just getting into the world of, for example, reenacting or historical education. Um, given you'd have to ignore the fact that this looks like a tiny version of Mel Gibson's sword from that movie, uh, hopefully if you remove this part, the more recognizable aspect of the sword will be removed and therefore you can use it for more educational topics. Uh, we will find out. But overall, I'm, I'm okay with this sword pending that the dissection goes okay. Uh, so why don't we um, go over the, we'll do the dissection uh, and then we'll do the notes on it and uh, we'll see how this sword ranks up. But I, I really like it. Honestly, I wouldn't use it for any fast um, sparring, obviously. Uh, or any fast movements, but honestly, it's solid enough where you could practice various HEMA guards and motions and drills without too much issue. Um, given it is a hand and a half, not a long sword, um, there's not a lot of uh, hand and a half movements in HEMA. It's always for long swords, um, which is fine. You can use the one-handed style or the two-handed style with it, which is which is fun. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, switch over to dissection mode. We'll see how it turns out. All right, here we are um, about to dissect this uh, Whetstone Cutlery, William Wallace Medieval Sword Silver Edition. Uh, just a reminder, we are planning on removing this, the leather guard from the Killian, I'm sorry, not the Killian, the Ricasso, uh, in order to see if we can make this a more historically authentic looking sword. Um, before I forget, I have been wanting to try to put more legitimate specs on these reviews. So let's see what the length of this whole sword is. Given you can probably get all this online, but, you know, might as well see how authentic it is. So from the very tip of the blade to the very bottom of the pommel, total sword length is 39 and a half inches. Um, we also have the entire blade length as 28 and a half inches. So, there you go, some specs. <laughs> All right, so usually when you get grips like the pleather or leather or other covered grips, uh, if it's a fabric of some kind as opposed to wire, 
usually you'll find a seam. And the seam is here. You can see it also extends down to the grip, though these are two separate pieces of pleather. Be careful when you use these, especially when you have a rusty, nasty one like mine. I promise you one of these days I'll be uh, getting a new razor blade, but uh, these reviews aren't really making me too much money, and this is the only time I use it. <laughs> money yet. So go across the seam. Be very careful. Honestly, this is pleather, so if I happen to nick it, I'm really not worried about it. I'm not planning on using it for anything. One of these days I'll make a video on how to identify pleather, but sword reviews are too much fun. Okay, so here's a voiceover over a video recorded after the fact where the audio failed. So we finished taking the pleather off of the sword, and right now I'm showing you the plastic piece, yes it's plastic, that, can sit, that made up that bulb underneath the pleather. Once I got the pleather off, I just used that knife to kind of slide under it and then pop it off to break it, and then it slides right off. Unfortunately, you can kind of see how messy the sword is underneath the pleather. Um, it doesn't look too bad. Uh, it's mostly something I could take off with some oil and some sandpaper or a Brillo pad. Um, maybe some copper wire or copper uh, wool if I need to. Um, but other than that, I do think that taking that off did make the sword a better look. Uh, it is kind of weird that you can still see the Ricasso so high up, though there are some examples of swords that do have a kind of dull ricasso that immediately turns into a sharp blade, but maybe not on a sword that small. Other than that, I think that that's a, it turned out good, and uh, catch you guys next time.